The BYU Cougars are now 5-0 and on the season, ranked 17th in the country. What did we learn after re-watching the Baylor win? Well, there was some good, there was some bad, even a little bit of ugly, and we'll talk about all of it ahead on today's show. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first view or listen of the day. And of course, as we like to say, thank you to all of you who are everydayers right here on your original daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. Go to FanDuel.com right now, place your first bet, $5 bet, excuse me, and get $200 in bonus bets. $5 bet, $200 in bonus bets, guaranteed courtesy of our friends at FanDuel. Go to FanDuel.com to get started today. All right, let's dive right in on today's show. BYU is now 5-0, and and if you saw the national polls yesterday, BYU in the AP Top 25 poll rose to number 17. Just one spot in front of the University of Utah. Yes, the Utes are behind the Cougars in the national polls, so feel free to stick it to your fellow neighbors and friends who may be Utah fans. They got uh, pretty thoroughly beaten, it felt like, by Arizona on Saturday night. I actually have plans to go back and rewatch that game in its entirety to get a feel more of what BYU should expect when they take on Arizona a week from Saturday, but we'll get to that later on in this bye week. But the bigger thing for BYU is, is they are a top 20 team and riding high, and they should be. Because I say it on this podcast, and somebody got after me, by the way, after the postcast where I came down a little bit hard, you felt like, on BYU's offense in the second half of this Baylor game and said that I was a little too harsh on them. Maybe I was, but as I said in that podcast, and I'll reiterate here, good teams find ways to win. Guess what? BYU's 5-0. and They are a good team. They are finding ways to win. They have found multiple ways to win games. This game against Baylor It got shaky multiple times in that second half, but credit to BYU. They bowed up and did exactly what they needed to do in big moments to get the W. Once again, that's the mark of what I consider to be a good football team. It's a top 20 team, and there's no reason that BYU shouldn't be uh, a top 20 team. In fact, uh, they are a team that should be feeling very, very good about themselves, and I assume that they are feeling good about themselves no matter what any of us out in the uh, outside world may say about them. Let's start on the positive front. What did I take away after re-watching BYU in that game against Baylor? Number one, Jake Retzloff was really, really good in that first half. I would say it's his best half of football of the season. I think we're still waiting on him to put together what I would consider a seminal performance, kind of a a full 60-minute virtuoso type uh, deal where he goes out and just makes it look perfect. It's not there yet, but I think we forget that Jake still has not started double-digit games in his collegiate career at the FBS level or now Power 4 level. And in fact, he has faced probably stiffer competition in the nine games he's played to this point. He will now be uh, facing off against Oklahoma State, that's two weeks out, uh, Arizona in his 10th career start. I would say that his nine starts to date are the toughest nine games any BYU quarterback has ever faced in terms of competition level. I, you can argue with me on that, but I really do think he has faced the toughest slate of games of any first time starter for BYU. And I still think we're seeing him get better and better Saturday's first half. He was absolutely electric in the second half. In fact, had not, I counted four uh, passes I consider to be drops. Now, my uh, definition of a drop is obviously different than other people's. I know that Pro Football Focus said that uh, BYU had four dropped passes in that game. They may not have been the four that I thought, but had some of those passes been caught in the second half, I think we're talking about maybe more of one of those performances where it's like Jake's really putting this together. But for 30 minutes, absolutely electric and the pro football focus grades indicate as such they had him as BYU's highest rated player against Baylor and I don't think you can take anything away from what he did especially in that first half of play he was in full control of BYU's offense 13 to 17 let's see what it was 180 yards uh that he was accounted for all four touchdowns he ran for one they I still think that Chase Roberts, they called it a run because it was a lateral pass. I'm fairly certain that was, if it was lateral, it was inches off. I would still count as a touchdown pass, but I would consider him to have accounted for all four touchdowns in that first half. I really liked what I saw from him. The one thing that helped him quite a bit was BYU had a physical run game. 
Well, what happened in the second half? Because I think the running, rushing attack in the second half really, as I talked about on Saturday, kind of locked up BYU's offense. We'll talk about that momentarily as we get to more of the some of the stuff that I think needs to be fixed for BYU. But I really did like how the offensive line, even without Connor Pay, they lost Connor, by the way, uh, in the second series, after the second series, excuse me, the short field, BYU cashes in on that, and he doesn't come back in the game. Looking at the film, it looks like he got injured earlier on in the game. I believe it was uh, on a, it was a play that like a three yard pickup where you can kind of see him get uh, in a way kind of wasn't rolled up on, but that kind of rolls into him, and it felt like he was limping from that point. Now, all of you are probably Jake. Well, what have you heard from Connor? I'm sure you talked to him. He's not said a word to me. He's still planning on coming on the podcast. I don't know what he plans to say, if he plans to address it at all, but stay tuned for that uh, later on this week and maybe as soon as tomorrow if schedules uh, permit. But looking forward to that. But losing him, it felt like BYU was going to struggle, and they did eventually. But for the first half, BYU's rushing attack, I thought was very, very good, and it allowed Jake Retzloff to really operate when he was at his best. And when it, What that is, is he's very good in play action. You allow BYU's rushing attack to suck up those linebackers and Jake can just kind of turn around and sling it over their heads. It's absolutely electric how good BYU's offense can be at that point. I think the full, the maybe the best indication of that, remember that 44 yard touchdown pass to Darius Lassiter. That was play action. Jake uh, fakes the handoff, turns around, uncorks a dime to Darius Lassiter, 44 yards. He's in the end zone and putting it right over his shoulder in, in front of the defender. It was really, Really well done. And I think that's some of the best we have seen from Jake Retzloff in the offense. Uh, other things I liked in this, I really liked how Enoch Nawahine runs the football. He doesn't have the same type of wiggle as the term I like to use with regards to like LJ Martin, even maybe a Pokai Haunga, where they can go a little more lateral and uh, kind of make sidestep guys. But what I love about Enoch is what he maybe lacks in that quote unquote wiggle is he makes up for it with just hard nosed north south running. Uh, and you need guys like that. You need guys when you have a third and one, and you somebody just come downhill and be a battering ram. He can be that. I really like that about Enoch Nawahine. I think his role with this BYU offense, planning on a guy like LJ Martin coming back after the bye, I think that role will be very uh, useful for a guy like Enoch Nawahine to fill in for BYU. They need that guy like that. Defensively. Real quick, I really liked overall how BYU performed in this game. I know they gave up a ton of yards through the year. Rewatching this game, Sawyer Robertson at points in this game was looking absolutely lights out. And the funny thing about it is BYU was getting close to getting him. They were getting pressure on him. He would bail out of the pocket, make a pinpoint laser throw. His wide receivers, they absolutely made some incredible circus-type catches and bailed him out. He was very, very good in this game, but BYU did not allow Baylor to run the ball at all. They bottled it up. It was really, really fun to see how good the rush defense was. And in fact, I missed it watching the game live, but re-watching it, Tyler Batty had one of his finest performances for BYU in that game. I know he had the sack, obviously one of three that BYU had in the game, but it felt like had things uh, played out a little differently. He may have had two or three in this game. And I know after that sack, it looked like he said something uh, to the to Sawyer Robertson. We'll have to ask him and see if he wants to fess up on what he said. But I really liked how Tyler played. He actually was better in uh, – um, run fits I felt like than he was in pass pro he was really good about engaging the opposing offensive lineman who's supposed to block him identifying the run where the run is going to where the play is going to shedding that blocker and then making plays I was really really impressed with how Tyler Batty played in this one I was I was actually very uh, high re-watching this I know the pro football focus grades indicated as such but it was something that I missed live I just didn't I it didn't point out to me in game that he was playing as well as he did, but rewatching, I was really impressed. And I felt like BYU's defense across the board at all three levels got contributions in big ways. Remember crew Wakely, we talked about it in our postcast. I had named him defensive MVP. He was absolutely all over the field. It was really cool to see him doing his thing. And I think that he deserves even more time on the field if he can manage it because he was a one-man wrecking crew. Had a sack, a tackle for loss, the interception that sealed the win for BYU, four critical solo tackles in that one. I felt like at all three levels, BYU got major contributions, including guys like Isaiah Glasker and Jack Kelly at linebacker. Also on the defensive line, can't take anything away from Blake Mangelson. He continues to absolutely impress from his defensive tackle position. 
And it's really good to see BYU's defense continuing to perform well, even if it was, quote unquote, their weakest performance to date. They still got the job done. They limited Baylor to 28 points. And I think with some extra fine tuning in the in the bye week, this defense can get even better, can take it to even another level, it feels like, going forward. All right. What needs to change for BYU? What went wrong in that game against Baylor is they nearly uh, saw that lead evaporate against the Bears. Well, there's two or three things that stood out to me rewatching this game. Some of them are holdovers from Saturday that I talked about, but one in particular rewatching this game became absolutely glaringly obvious to me. And we'll dig into that next right here on Locked on Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. NFL fans, my friends, you can have some fun this season with a big return with our friends at FanDuel. They are America's number one sports book after all. Now, if you're not even an NFL fan, you want to take advantage of NHL opportunities, NBA, college football, they've got it all for you guys. The one thing I can say about what FanDuel is, is they got an app that is super simple and easy to use, and it's very straightforward. So when you get a hunch in the middle of a game you're watching, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets and do it with our friends at FanDuel. And of course, you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Think about that. $200 in bonus bets guaranteed place a $5 bet. It's as simple as that, my friends. Go to FanDuel.com to get started today. That's FanDuel.com. They are, once again, America's number one sports book. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first view and or listen of the day. If you have not done so already, check out the Locked On College Football Podcast. Spencer McLaughlin's doing an incredible job covering the overall uh, universe of college uh, college football out there. He's covering everything. And it really feels like he's doing an incredible job. If you want kind of a 30,000-foot view of what's going on in the college football universe, check out Locked On College Football. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, rewatching this game against Baylor once again. BYU gets the win, but it wasn't without weaknesses that showed up and not showing up obviously after the fact as I rewatched this game. The one major thing I feel like that BYU struggled with, and this is kind of why I think BYU's offense, as I said on Saturday, went into a clamshell, is that Baylor in the second half. They decided to pack the box. They decided, you know what? BYU's not going to gouge us on these running plays and set themselves up for uh, shots over the top in play action. They brought a seventh and maybe an eighth man at different points, if you rewatch the tape, into the box and made it really, really tough for BYU to run the football. They were filling uh, gaps very nicely. Uh, They sent extra guys that BYU simply couldn't block in the run schemes. And to their credit, they made it very, very difficult for BYU's offensive line. I said earlier, I feel like the offensive line in the first half was very, very good. I think at halftime, Dave Aranda and the Baylor staff noticed that Sonny Moccasini filling in at center for BYU, they decided to test him. And in the second half, it wasn't as good as it was in the first half. And I, like I said, it's more because they packed the box. They put seven and eight guys in there, and BYU was not able to get the push that they had in the first half against a lighter box, five and even six guys at different points. The thing about Sonny Moccasini is he was thrust into, I think, a no-win situation. Most of you uh, know, maybe you don't, that throughout training camp, BYU had Connor Pay obviously entrenched as their starting center. They tried a number of different guys early on in training camp to see who would be the uh, second string center. Sonny Moccasini got a crack at it. Guys like Sam Dog got a crack at it. Uh, even uh, guys uh, like, um, who am I thinking of, Weston Jones and some of these other return missionaries got an opportunity. But the guy that emerged at that center spot during training camp was Jake Icorn, the Weber State transfer. Now, Icorn uh, joined BYU last year, and there's some question of where he ultimately would end up for BYU on the offensive line. Well, he was out due to injury in this game. So for lack of a better term, BYU went into this one. And when Connor Pay was lost due to injury, Sonny Moccasini was thrust into a role where he, in my mind, was third string at, at center. And Baylor made the BYU pay for it. The jumble in the offensive line on the interior of the offensive line for BYU didn't them no favors either because Waylon Lopwaho came up uh, injured a little bit, had to go out for a little bit, and then came back in. They threw Bruce Mitchell in there. And the thing about it is BYU over these next two weeks, depending on how long Connor's out for, and once again, I just don't know. I'm, I'm not lying to you guys when he hasn't said a word to me on the injury front is that they've got two weeks now to figure it out. If Sonny Moccasini is going to be the center, get him extra snaps, get him extra work, because his snaps obviously were very low. And once again, I think he was thrown into a situation where all of a sudden it's like, hey, 
you got to get in there. You got to you got to play center when you're preparing all week to play guard. It's a different thing when you're out there having to make the calls, identify what they like to call the mic or the middle linebacker in terms of the scheme and how you're going to adjust to it for the rest of the offensive line. It was a really, really tough deal. And for however long Connor's out for, they have got to a, either get Jake Eichhorn back and get him entrenched there as the guy at center, or once again, rework the interior. If that's Sonny Moccasini at center, Bruce Mitchell, Ake, or Austin Leusa at right guard and Wayne Luapo at left guard, you got to find the right combination of guys because BYU loves to run the inside zone running uh, concept. We hear all the time that BYU likes to run wide zone. Well, the other thing they like to run is called inside zone, and BYU's inside zone in the second half was abysmal. And it's nothing against, like I said, Sonny Moccasini or the other interior offensive linemen. I think the shuffle be caused because of Connor Pay's loss, it caused BYU to struggle mightily. Had that inside zone gotten going for BYU like it was in the first half, I felt like they would have been actually very okay offensively. But when it gets blown up like that, it really shuts down everything else BYU tries to do. The few times BYU had success running the football in that second half was on option plays and wide zone. And we're talking going to the outside the tackle. It's kind of funny to think. Remember, in the preseason, BYU fans were wondering if Caleb Etienne was going to be able to hold up a left tackle. BYU's tackles, uh, Caleb Etienne and Braden Kime, they are not the problem right now for BYU. It's the interior of the offensive line, and it's actually a really good time to have this bye week because if Connor's out for an extended period, and fingers crossed, it's it's not as serious as I would hope it isn't. Does that sound right? I'm just I'm just hoping it's not a serious injury. That's that's the long and short of it. But you got two weeks here to figure out what you're doing. You got to rework it and work some guys maybe into different positions. I really think that you're going to find an opportunity here over these next two weeks to find options on the interior of the O-line. If you don't, well, guess what? People are going to watch that second half of what Baylor did against the interior BYU's offensive line, and they will attack it. They will make life miserable for BYU, and this could go back to more of what a running attack was last year as opposed to what it's been at points this year where it felt like it was really finally clicking and starting to come along. So uh, that's one glaring issue. Another issue I saw in this game is that in the second half, BYU's wide receivers needed to bail Jake Retzloff out in a, a couple of circumstances. A couple of the drops that Darius Lassiter had, one that Parker Kingston had, those hurt BYU as juxtaposed against what Baylor did. Baylor's wide receivers were absolutely uh, bailing Sawyer Robertson out. He's not the most accurate quarterback. You watch some of those throws, and they were a little bit off, but good wide receivers will make their quarterback look good. And BYU's first half performance for the wide receivers as compared to the second half, Really, really different feel to it. And like I said, those drops kind of, it, it, it affected everything BYU tried to do. Had those been uh, receptions, things might've looked a little different for the Cougars. And it very well may have helped the offensive line by uh, allowing Baylor or forcing Baylor to back off. So that's one thing. And then also BYU zone concepts on defense in this game. I saw a lot of quarters. Um, and if you don't know what quarters is, essentially the cornerbacks and the safeties have what they call a quarter zone. So they have a quarter piece of the deep part of the field that they're supposed to cover. In those quarters, well, obviously you're waiting for wide receivers to come through that zone and you pick them up. The problem is when Sawyer Robertson bailed out of the pocket uh, when BYU finally got pressure on him, the the concept is called plaster. And I know that my friend Brent, Ben Criddle, who I've worked with for many, many years, he talks about this a lot on his radio show and he's right about this. When it goes into scramble drill mode, as a defensive back, you find the closest wide receiver and you plaster yourself to that guy and you just stay with them. Too often, BYU did not plaster well enough and it costs them in multiple circumstances. So I'm sure that Jay Hill will be barking at his guys all week long in practice and telling them, hey, we're going to scramble drill mode. What happens? Find a guy, stay with them, and don't allow them to get loose. Because when that happens, when you lose contact or that, that plaster technique, that's when wide receivers find themselves all alone. That's when the zone gets blown up and you find those uh, really, really deep shots. The third and 14 conversions, the fourth and eight. So you, you remember those conversions that Baylor had? It felt like a lot of times when those came, became scramble drills, Sawyer Robertson bailed out. And for whatever reason, a wide receiver found himself uncovered, sat down in the zone, and he hit him for a big gain or hit him on the sideline for a big gain. And that that hurt BYU. So they got to be better about their plaster technique, it feels like. And I, and if I'm seeing this, I, I say this all the time. I'm an amateur uh, a film guy out there. I watch and I try and glean as much as I can. 
I don't even know a tenth, I'm sure, of what Jay Hill is going to be barking at his guys for. But that quarter's defense, the zone defense concepts for BYU in that game, they struggled a lot, especially in that second half. The good news was that Jay adjusted and put them into more man press schemes, and that had a far better effect as the game progressed. And obviously, uh, finishing off that uh, interception by Crew Wakely, a thing of beauty. They baited Sawyer Robertson to think he was going to throw that way, and all the crew did said, okay, throw that up there. I dare you. He does it. Crew just sails over like a center fielder in baseball, picks it off. That's all she wrote. Game over. And that was a really, really good play for BYU. All right. So that's what I got for you guys in terms of what needs to change for BYU. Now, what are the goals ahead for BYU as they go through a bye week? Well, I'm going to call it the bye week blues because BYU obviously would rather be playing a game. That's how football players operate. They love to be uh, just kind of in the rhythm of the season and going game by game, getting a feel uh, for what uh, they need to do on a week by week basis. What do they need to accomplish in this bye week? I think to have a, a successful week, kind of lay it out. We'll talk about that as you wrap up this edition of Locked On Cougars next, right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Today's show is about you by our friends over at Game Time. If you want to go out to anything you want to go to, whether it's sporting events, uh, concerts, theater, uh, if you like comedy, whatever you're into, uh, the best part about Game Time is they got the options for you guys. They have a brand new feature in their app called Game Time Picks, which makes getting your tickets for your favorite live events even easier. It filters out all the fluff, going through all the thousands of tickets it feels like that are on the website to find you the best deals and save you the time of having to search for those deals. I say this a lot, but my favorite feature from game time, because I get so sick of going to buy tickets for an event and all of a sudden I'm getting a, a litany of uh, fees added on after I have had the ticket price in mind. Well, the best part is you can toggle the all in uh, ticket pricing feature and it shows you exactly what the price is, all fees included on the game time app. It's a really fun thing. Toggle it. You know exactly what you're paying right up front. So take the guesswork out of buying your tickets and do it with our friends over at game time today. Download the game time app, create an account, and use the promo code locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Again, create an account, redeem the promo code locked on college. That's L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for $20 off. Of course, terms apply, but download the game time app today. What time is it? It's game time. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first view or listen of the day. If you have not done so already, sign up for our Locked On Cougars Insider Group. Get the inside scoop on all things BYU sports. Uh, anything I hear about BYU that I am uh, feeling like I need to pass along, guess who the first people get to hear it? They, it comes to our Locked On Cougars Insider Group. It's a, It comes in the form of a text message. It's not get much more direct than that. You're not having to go to a message board or having to log into a website to get the inside scoop. So join us today. It's Locked On Cougars Insider Group. Uh, click the link in the show notes below whether you're watching and or listening to this. Join today, 14-day free trial, and hope you guys will be a member of the Insider Group that we already have a really strong uh, group of people already in there. So thank you for your support of those who are already there, and hopefully many more of you will be joining us in due time. All right. The week ahead for BYU is an important one because bye weeks are obviously critical for guys getting healthy. And we talked about it in the postcast edition of the show. Uh, the coming out of the Baylor game, I had a list darn near double digits in terms of guys who got injured, either coming into that game injured against a Baylor or got injured in the game and need time to heal up. Obviously not all of the injuries are going to be, Hey, one week you're good to go. Cause that's just, it's football. It's a violent sport. And let's address that just for a moment. I had a couple of people after I put that tweet out on our Locked On Cougars uh, Twitter account said that BYU, of course, leading the college football universe and in injuries every single year. They're not leading. Here's the thing. Injuries happen in every, I mean, every football program. It's a violent sport, everybody. And if you think that BYU is going to skate through a season without injuries, you're up in the, you're up in the night. The nice part is a bye week arrived here for BYU where they can heal up a little bit. Remember, I was it two years ago that they had a bye week. The, final, the bye week finally came like week 10 of the season, and it did no good. It was just a waste in many respects because that's so late in the season that guys have been kind of grinding through playing for two plus months on uh, bad knees, bad arms, bad shoulders, whatever they've got going on. At that point, it's tough. Five weeks in, BYU gets a much-deserved rest this week. And I don't think BYU is atypical. And I... It takes some research to look at this and say, hey, hey, how many injuries does BYU have? And that's the thing about this is without standardized uh, re injury reports out there in college football, it'd be a foolhardy thing to really try and track down. But I don't think BYU is atypical in terms of the amount of injuries. In fact, until the game against Baylor, BYU had been very, very injury-free relative uh, to how, they, how t physical a football they had been playing. Remember, 
BYU is the only 5-0 team who's beaten fe- uh, three fellow Power 4 members in that 5-0 start. They have played hard-nosed football essentially since the get-go of the season. They have been facing some really, really stiff competition, and injuries did pile up against Baylor. The nice part is they were healthy pretty much all the way up to that point. Are these minor injuries? Are they going to affect BYU going forward? That remains to be determined, but you got a full essentially 14 days to get guys right ahead of that Arizona stretch. And then you got to go through three more games. Then you get another bye week and a rest before the final stretch run of the season. I actually really like how the buys have worked out. And especially considering the injuries BYU dealt with in that Baylor game, this will be a very, very nice break for them. Other things that need to be worked on. Like I said, you need to rework that interior of the offensive line. Find the best combination of three guys. Whether that's Waylon Lapuaho having to go from left guard to right guard, maybe uh, putting Bruce Mitchell out there at either guard spot, because at this point, I feel like Bruce is a starting uh, caliber offensive lineman for BYU. He has been very, very good since that start he had against Kansas State. Uh, as Austin Leusa come in, does Jake Icorn come back? You got to figure out what you're doing on the interior of the offensive line. I also want to see what BYU decides to do at linebacker. Uh, it, with Harrison Taggart is unable to go. Is it Celia Sarah's job? Is it going to be Jack Kelly maybe sliding into, into the middle? You got to re- rework that a little bit, depending on how long a guy like Harrison Taggart is out for here. And then also, I want to see what BYU decides to change up in their overall scheme. Now, they may be subtle things. They may not be glaring things that BYU changes going into that Arizona game. But if they're going to experiment with stuff, change maybe how they philosophically are going to approach uh, defending the run, defending the pass, how they're going to go about uh, in terms of the offensive uh, attack. They're going to change stuff up. This is a critical week to do it. You've got five games of evidence and tape to look back on and say, okay, like that, don't like that, like that, don't. And guess what? You have an opportunity now to kind of take a step back, use this week and say, okay, here's what's worked for us through five weeks here, guys. Uh, speaking as if I'm one of the coaches of BYU, here's what we need to improve. And here's what we're going to attempt to do to change up and get better at X, Y, and Z here. That's the most thing. That's the most critical thing. I feel like this week the BYU can accomplish. Is it going to be easy? No, because guess what? Like I said, a lot of guys are nursing dings and dents. There's a lot of guys having to catch up on schoolwork. Uh, it's a critical week, obviously, uh, in terms of giving us some extra time off as well. One thing I know about this BYU football team, and they have shown it through five games considering they started 5-0, and is they do love ball. And that's something that Tyler Batty has said multiple times in press conferences. We have a lot of guys who, here who love ball. I think they're excited to get to work. They're excited to put in the time, but they're also excited to have some downtime as well. They'll probably have the weekend off uh, with a general conference for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I wouldn't be surprised on social media to see some of those photos pop of those guys going up to general conference sessions over the weekend. But it, it is a critical time for BYU to get better here. You can't waste this week. I know that they won't because Kalani Satake has already kind of set the message uh, post-game against Baylor. He said that, hey, show up Monday, we're getting back to work. He was dissatisfied, I think, with how BYU performed overall against Baylor. And I'm sure he'll have plenty for BYU to work on. But this is a critical week. It's not a week you just take it off and say, hey, okay, guys, hit the training room. I talk to the uh, the physicians and let's get you guys all healed up. No, there's still work to be done. There's schemes to be reworked. There's lineups to be changed. There's a whole philosophical uh, element to this of, okay, five games in. Teams expect us to do this. How do we approach it differently so they can't attack us the same way that other teams have? It's a big week for BYU, and I'm fully expecting they will take full advantage of getting that work in because knowing what I know of this team and the work they've put in this offseason, they're not going to rest on their laurels. They're ecstatic to be 5-0. I-, I can assure you of that. They're ecstatic to be ranked 17th in the country, and depending ha- on how this weekend goes upcoming, they could be ranked 15th in the country when Arizona shows up at the Lavelle Edwards Stadium a week from Saturday. And that would be a, a really, really fun thing to have in BYU's back pocket. But I don't think this team is satisfied in any way, shape, or form with how they perform this year. Once again, they are a good team. They have found ways to win football games this year in spite of different circumstances that might have uh, caused them to lose games in the past. Well, can they take it to another level? And that's what this week is going to be, I think, a critical test of what BYU's got in the tank. Can they go out there, really show what they're made of, use this week effectively, and then hit the ground running once again when they get back into action next week against Arizona? Time will tell, but I think this is a team, my read is, they will be very intent on improving this week, and that should yield a better uh, product, in theory, against Arizona a week from Saturday. 
All right, that'll do it for this Monday edition of the podcast. Thank you once again to all of you who tune in every single day. We love to call you guys every dayers because you truly are the uh, the best and brightest out there because you're getting the scoop on all things BYU have got for you guys every single day. But as always, no matter when, if this is your first or your last uh, visit to the show, I appreciate all of you. Thank you for making your first listen of the day. And as always, this has been the Locked on Cougars podcast.